Look at the water. It's all right, it. There was a, a, a man in the country of Uz named Job. He was a man of perfect integrity who feared God and turned away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. His estate included 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large number of servants. I've only got Anita. <laughs> Job was the greatest man amongst all the people of the East. His sons used to have banquets, each at his house in turn. They would send an invitation to their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Whenever a round of banqueting was over, Job would send for his children and purify them, rising early in the morning to offer burnt offerings for all of them. For Job thought, perhaps my children have sinned, having cursed God in their hearts. And this was Job's regular practice. One day the, the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? From roaming around the earth, Satan answered him, and walking around on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him? his household and everything he owns. You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions are spread out in the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns and he will surely curse you to your face. Very well, the Lord told Satan, everything he owns is in your power. However, you must not lay a hand on Job himself. So Satan went out from the Lord's presence. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and reported, while the oxen were ploughing and the donkeys grazing nearby, the Sabaeans swooped down and took them away. They struck down the servants with the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. He was still speaking when another messenger came and reported, a lightning storm struck from heaven. It burned up the sheep and the servants and devoured them, and now I alone have escaped to tell you. That messenger was still speaking when yet another came and reported, the Chaldeans formed three bands, made a raid on the camels and took them away. They struck down the servants with the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. He was still speaking when another messenger came and reported, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on the young people so that they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job stood up, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground and worshipped, saying, Naked, I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Praise the name of the Lord. Throughout all this, Job did not sin by blaming God for anything. When we read chapter 2 of Job, Satan again goes before God. God again says, my servant Job, a righteous man. And Satan says, but let me attack him. Let me attack him personally. And then watch him curse God. 
Poor Job. Poor Job. You know, this is a, a, a wonderful story um, from a period between 1,000 and 2,000 years before Christ. Um, maybe towards the latter end of that. that we don't know who the author was. Um, obviously a Jew, because uh, um, throughout the original text he uses the word Jehovah for God. Probably written in the latter part of that period, between 1,000 and 2,000 years before Christ. He was rich by human standards, and he was rich by spiritual standards too, because he worshipped God. Satan, Satan was there. He's always around, isn't he? What do they say about Satan in the New Testament? He prowls around, always looking to see who, can, who he can steal and destroy. He's at work today. Satan has to get God's permission, you know, that, that there is an order. There is an order. He is subservient to God. He had to get God's permission to tempt Job. You know, the wonderful thing here, you see, God would allow it because God knows the end of the story. God knows what's going to happen in the end. We know the end of the story, don't we? Well, you do if you've read the book of Job. If you don't, I'll tell you later, about two o'clock. But there's so much in this, in this book that Anita and I have been not wasting our time over this past month. We've been looking at this every day. Job was in a position of authority within his own family. As a priest, a spiritual elder within his own family. The family would sin but it would be Job as the father that would offer that sacrifice. Which suggests, doesn't it, that Moses was, Moses was writing between 1446 and 1406 BC. Moses set up the temple worship and the priesthood. So obviously I would guess that this was written before then. Otherwise, Job would have gone to the priests. You know, there are some similarities, I guess, between our situation today and what Job was going through. Not all of our children are saved. And we have to pray for them every day. As I am, I guess, the spiritual elder within our family. But at the end of the day, my children have got to make their own decisions in life. There's another message in this, in that, that the more you try to get on with God, the more you try to do for God, the more Satan is going to try and attack you. If you never experience persecution, if you will never experience satanic attack, it's because you're not doing anything for God. You may be born again, you may love the Lord Jesus Christ, but until you start proclaiming the name of Jesus, you're not a threat. He may have lost you, but when you start proclaiming the name of Jesus, you're a threat to his kingdom. When you start going out on the streets 
into Satan's own backyard and proclaim in the name of Jesus, you're going to come under attack. But we thank God that greater is he that he lives within us than he that lives in the world. Satan's real. But our God is greater. Our God is greater. Satan's real. You know, I always believed in a God. You know, I always believed in God. Even in my wild days, I believed in God. I, and I knew that if there was a God, there was a heaven. And if I knew there was a God, there was a Satan, a, a devil. And I knew there was a hell. And I had no, I was under no illusions at all that I was going to hell. I had no doubts about that whatsoever. If I was tempted in any way, I would submit to that temptation. I would do my best to upset as many people as possible because I hated just about everybody. And anybody that got in my patch, this thing here, my space, I would hit you. Um, because I didn't like people getting into my space. What a way of life. I knew I was going to hell. But Jesus, who is greater, overcome that. God allowed Satan to attack Job. Why? Oh, temptation. God will never allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able to, to go through. God allowed Satan to tempt Job, to attack Job, because God knew the end of this story from the beginning. God knew that no matter what Satan did to Job, Satan would, would not win. Even Jesus went through that terrible period of temptation. You remember when, as Jesus came out of the desert, it fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And Satan was there. Even quoting the word of God. Satan quoted the word of God to Jesus. And Jesus responded with the word of God. But Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, had the ultimate authority. The word without the Spirit is dead. Satan can only quote a dead word to you. Jesus has the living word. He is the living word. The power of the Holy Spirit, the anoint of the Holy Spirit, brings the word of God to life. Job's three friends turn up. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. It's great to have friends. Job's comforters, they're called. Three best mates turn up and they spend the next 35 chapters trying to persuade Job that you must have sinned. And Job spends those 35 chapters trying to justify himself before God. Have you got friends like that? You know, with friends like that, who needs enemies? I, I, I used to have lots of friends. You know, Christmas is a time that I, I never liked. Um, I'd spent it in children's homes and prisons and places, and I never liked Christmas. And the only way I could deal with Christmas was I'd start drinking on Christmas Eve, and I would sober up on New Year's Day. And an eight-day binge... And all my friends, you know, they'd come round to our house. We'd buy hundreds of pounds worth of booze. My friends would turn up at different times throughout that day period and get drunk with me. It was great. I got saved in the August. I stopped drinking in the October. I didn't tell anybody, but nobody turned up. Nobody turned up. But I stopped drinking 
but nobody came. So were they really friends? Were these people, Eliphaz and Bildad so far, were they really friends? Can you trust the people of this world to a point, maybe? But you can only trust the Lord Jesus Christ fully. You've obviously sinned, Job. None of this would have happened to you if you hadn't sinned. You've obviously failed God. Even his wife was saying to him, curse God and die. Curse God and die. Poor Job had to justify himself. Then Elihu turns up. Younger, not as experienced, maybe a little bit more spiritual, not quite as condemnatory, but it was still that same message, still the same accusations, you know, in a more gentle way. He didn't actually condemn Job, but he was still of the opinion that Job must have sinned in some way for God to turn his back on him. For God to have allowed all of this to happen. You know, we have to get through all the way to chapter 38 before we actually hear from God. It says, then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this who obscures my counsel with ignorant words? Get ready to answer me like a man. When I question you, you will inform me. Where were you? When I establish the earth, tell me if you've got understanding, if your knowledge, if your wisdom is greater than mine, I am God, tell me. And I find these next couple of chapters amazing. God questions Job, but does not answer Job's questions regarding his suffering. But he doesn't humiliate Job either, and he doesn't condemn Job. So simply by implication, Job was not guilty of sin. There's no condemnation from God. Simply God saying, who are you? Who are you? I created the heavens and the earth. I created everything in them for his glory, for my glory, he says. You're mere man. You're only a human being. Obviously, you know, it's a scary thought, isn't it, that God was listening to all of these conversations that are taking place. God doesn't cock a deaf and, you know. He hears everything. He sees everything. You know, I love the psalmist that talks about when I was in my mother's womb, you knew me. Where can I go to escape from you? I cannot go anywhere. For you're there. You're always there. God was with Job throughout this terrible period in Job's life. And, you know, we, we go through some difficult times too, don't we? You know, we've prayed for people here. We go through some terrible times. I went through eight years of horrific, horrific depression where I'd go to bed at night sometimes crying and I'd be praying, God, if you love me, God, you know, God, if you really, really love me, you won't let me wake up in the morning. I always did. So then I'd argue with God again, well, why did you let me wake up? But you see, God knows the end 
from the beginning. All we have is this moment. We don't even have tomorrow. Poor Job. God was obviously listening to Job's friends and to that conversation. I guess, and, and this is something that was, uh, he must have had his head in his hands like that going, you know, why? Why? Why don't you turn to me, Job? Instead of trying to justify yourself in front of your friends, why not turn to me? Our knowledge and our understanding is so inferior to God's. I want to read, uh, if I can find it, I stuck a piece of paper in here somewhere. From Ecclesiastes, poor Solomon. Eh? He sounded like when he, when he wrote this, he was a bit depressed too. <clears throat> in the day of prosperity, be joyful. Okay? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider without question that God has made one as well as the other. God has made them both. So that man cannot discover anything that will come after him. In my futile life, I've seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in spite of his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who lives long in spite of his evil. God understands. God's wisdom is greater. When we look at Job, right at that last chapter, chapter 42 of Job, having listened to God, Job says, I know that you can do anything and no plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that conceals my counsel with ignorance? Surely I spoke about things that I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. When I question you, you will inform me. I had heard rumours about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I take back my words and I repent in dust and in ashes. I repent in dust and in ashes. And what follows is God taking the three friends to task, causing them to serve Job who was more righteous than them. For Job to pray for them and for their restoration. And then it says, and the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the earlier. 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And so he went on. And Job lived another 140 years after this. You know, the message that I get from this is so simple. Seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added unto you as well. Put God first in your life. Oh, yeah, no, things happen. Oh, my right leg, 
18 hours in A&E. There's nothing quite like spending 18 hours in A&E. And then three days later, having to go back and spend in, what's it, five, six hours, and then a few days after that, another 12 hours in A&E. You know, the nurses are running around like crazy. But the whole system needs a good shake-up. It needs Jesus in charge of it instead of man. Things happen in your life that are not pleasant at the time. Some things are unavoidable. Sickness, an accident, whatever it may be. Unavoidable. But Romans 8.28 says that we have to praise the Lord in all things. Okay? To praise the Lord in all things. For all things work together for the God of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. My life is at 100 mile an hour. I live at 100 mile an hour. I sometimes ride my bike in excess of 100 mile an hour. But that's my life. But this accident caused me to sit down with my leg in the air and read the word of God without interruption almost for three weeks. To pray and to study. I've got enough material for six months of sermons without drying up. This is God. Maybe if I'd slow down a little, maybe if I took more care, took more time out, then maybe life would have been different. It was an amazing day. My bike was due for the MOT on the Friday, but I took it a day early. Not half an hour, but a day early. And as I got it out onto the drive and went back to shut the garage door, I shut it on top of my head. And Bob, you know what it's like. You've got nothing on there to protect you. You know what it's like. It hurts. In fact, there was a little cut that it cut the top of my head. So you think, you know, and then I, I sat on my bike and I, I'd still got my big touring seat on it, which made the bike an inch higher than it should have been. And I thought, I need to take this off. I need to take it off. I'll do it later. So then reversed it down the drive with one wheel on the pavement, one wheel on the road. Strange angle. And in my head, I knew it was going down on the floor. I should just put it back in the garage. But being stubborn, being stubborn, I decided I'm going to run with this. I'd had the three warnings, three strikes and you're out. It was on the floor with my leg underneath it and a dint in my tank. Poor tank, poor bike. You see, God was in that too. In the whirlwind of our lives, God speaks to us. Listen to God speaking into your life today. He's speaking. What's he saying to you? I know what he said to me in those three weeks, other than to study Job. It was to take time out. And even Anita this week said, preaching here this morning, and I'm in Stoke-on-Trent preaching at a Church of England tonight, and the same next week, and then the week after. And Anita said, Colin, you've got to take time out. Father, <coughs> in surrendering our lives to you, Lord, it's giving everything, not just our sin, it's but our hopes, our past, our present, our future. 
And Lord, we, we've got so much more to receive from you. If only we'd take time out to talk to you, to listen to what it is you're saying to us. You've got a plan for our lives, Father. But how will we know what that plan is until we take time, Father, to listen as we pray this conversation that is prayer? So often it's a one-way thing. Lord, we need to hear from you. You to tell us, Father, to direct our paths. Because that's where the blessing is. That's where the blessing is. That's where the harvest is, Father. In submitting to Jesus Christ. So my prayer is simple, Father, that you would use us, that you'd be glorified in our lives, but that we would in all things remember to praise you, to put you first. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I don't press buttons, Bob. So if we've got another hymn, it's beyond me. Don't press it yet. I'll press it.